everyone for joining us today and very warm, warm welcome to everyone. I sincerely hope you and your loved ones are all safe and well. Um, it's great to see so many people joining. If you want to comment on the chat box from which part of the world you're joining from, that would be great. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to be um, focusing on corporations and COVID um, bailout saviors. And by way of introduction, my name is Manvi Lada. I'm a bachelor student at SOA studying economics and politics, and I'm going to be moderating today. Um, so today's webinar is the 12th webinar in the Economics of COVID-19 series. It's a series organized by the Department of Economics at SOAS alongside the Open Economics Forum, which is a student association part of the Rethinking Economics Network, which aims to introduce plurality in economic debate. Um, I'm just going to start by saying a huge thank you to everyone behind the team, um, behind the scenes, sorry, that's working to make the webinars happen. They've been incredibly fascinating to learn from. So um, if you haven't been able to attend any of the previous webinars, they have been recorded and they're available on the SOAS economics page. And they've also been recorded and uploaded onto the SOAS Open Economics Forum Facebook page. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and uploaded as soon as possible. Um, to keep updated on the future events, feel free to follow our social media accounts. I've put them in the chat box and keep the conversation going with the hashtag economics of COVID. Um, so you can check that out as well. So today's speakers are Dr. Carolina Alves and Dr. Fawa Sial. So Fawa Sial is a postdoc at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. She's the co-editor at Developing Economics and a co-convener of both DEcon um, and the Business and Development Working Group of the Development Studies Association. Um, her research interests include development aid, uh, political ecology, corporations, industrial policy, corporate social responsibility, private sector and international development. She tweets at Farwa Sial. Um, and Carolina Alves is a Joan Robertson Research Fellow in Heterodox Economics at Girton College, University of Cambridge. She is also a co-editor at Developing Economics, a co-founder of the Econ, currently sits on the advisory board of Rebuilding Macroeconomics and is a council member at the Progressive Economic Econ Economy Forum. Carolina's research interests include macroeconomics, money, monetary and fiscal policy, public debt, financialization, Marxist economics and Latin America. And she tweets at C-A-C-R-I-S Alvis. Um, so yeah, that's my introduction. I'm gonna pass it now to Farwa. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and thanks a lot to the Open Economics Forum and um, SOAS uh, Department of Economics. There's a lot of work which goes behind the scenes, especially in coordinating this and arranging everything. Um, so thank you so much for having us. I'm going to get right into the discussion. So to get us started, I'm going to start with the point of inequality and the impact of the pandemic. In the SOAS series alone, we've heard some very important talks on regional, sectoral, and country responses to the pandemic. And in some ways, um, or the other, most talks have touched upon this tension between the concept of developed countries and developing countries. Uh, for the first time, the very notion of vulnerability and structural inequality in the context of poverty and institutional weaknesses are being associated with develop developed countries uh, outside academia. Um, and in this context, the role of the corporate sector needs to be better understood, we think. At an organizational unit, as an organizational unit which serves as an engine of trade, commerce, finance, some remnants of innovation, as well as um, acting as a vehicle for political lobbying, the corporation has always been at the heart of the capitalist system. Um, of course, it has also played a very powerful role internationally. And the purpose of our talk today is to look at the corporations broadly in the US and the UK and highlight the socioeconomic relations which bind corporate empowerment with inequality. So I'm going to be talking about three things and then Carolina will follow. So the first, I'm going to talk about the role of the corporate sector before the crisis. Second, on how corporations have responded to the crisis. Um, and I'm going to focus on some of the ways in which the profiteering has been happening. 
Third, I'm going to talk about uh, corporate philanthropy and governance. And then Carolina will focus on the nature of bailouts, which have favored the corporate sector disproportionately in comparison to households. And we're trying to develop this term of bailout saviors in the context of the current pandemic. And I hope we, we have a time to discuss then. Um, so even for this very brief talk, I think it's helpful to mention the origins of the modern corporation, which lie in the imperial joint stock company. Although joint stock companies existed in ancient China and Japan, East India Company was different as a colonial enterprise involved in manufacturing, trade, financial services, as well as um, having its own army. So its political role in siphoning wealth from one part of um, one part of the world to another was undeniable. However, later literature on the theory of the firm takes a sort of disjuncture. On the one hand, you have the rise of so-called robber barons or this idea of monopoly capitalism in the form of corporations. Um, but there is also this push towards understand how the corporation works or the mechanics of it. So a lot of literature focuses on the organizational theory of the firm. There is emphasis on the M uh, firm or diversified model of the firm, which is um, focusing on uh, divisions within a firm, resource allocation, and mechanisms uh, which help coordinate uh, different activities in a firm. Uh, Williamson, Chandler, Penrose are some of the pioneers of that literature. Uh, but at the same there is a move towards a very atechnical understanding of the firm and a disjuncture from the socioeconomic. Uh, having said that, I think there were standard texts like Burl and Means writing in 1932, which are focusing on the concentration and political role of the firm. Following from that, the 1960s a transformation of companies towards financial managerialism completely transforms the previously limited speculative activities of the firm. Conglomerates now leverage their individual firms on financial markets, reorganizing firms to avail opportunities on capital markets, and indulge in aggressive merger and acquisition through highly politicized processes. So the financialization of the firm uh, sets the ground for the now very famous story of shareholder revolution of the 1980s, which accelerated against the speculation on financial markets, empowered shareholders, stabilized share buybacks, and initiated the phenomena of shareholder activism to the ends of unmooring dividends from productive investment, a phenomena we see now as being very normal. The rise and crash of the 2001 dot-com bubble unfolded in this setting. The decline of U.S. manufacturing since the 1970s found a temporal fix with liberalization, the rise of venture capital, and growing equity investment in tech companies. Uh, sorry. Uh, also, um, without, so without revival of industrialization, the shift from one asset class to tech class enabled growth also on the back of outgoing, um, sorry, outgoing uh, uh, outsourcing. Um, but the implementation of a very loose monetary policy um, could not sustain corporate profits and, um, until the 2001 crash. In spite of the crash, central bank intervention continued to incline towards lowered interest rates, compelling new search for investments in areas such as some prime mortgage, as well as enabling the rise of platform capital, which I will talk about a little later. We now have a lot of information about the, two, the corporate failure leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. But the point to note is that no concerted efforts on, on the regulatory front were implemented to curb the excesses or share of share buybacks, moral hazard. And if you consider the four trends in the 2008 crisis, first is the fall in income share of labor. This has been written about uh, from heterodox economist point of view at length since the 1970s. The dissonance between productive investment and financialized accumulation, uh, something I just mentioned with respect to the role of the firm. The privatization of public goods, which has been an ongoing phenomenon. And fourth, a point which is missing here is the global um, skyrocketing of debt. Global debt skyrocketed to 113 uh, million just before the crisis. Uh, and mostly dominated by private debt. What's important to remember in terms of bringing this whole um, story together of corporate rise and inequality is the fact that while companies were in possession of something like two trillion dollars in cash, uh, 42 million Americans uh, were in food stamps. And this is just before the crisis. One last point that I want to mention uh, before I move on to the next slide is this idea of 
um, the north-south divide, which I don't think gets enough attention, especially with relation to the corporate sector. A lot of corporate activity, which happens, continues to extract wealth from one part of the world to another. And we can see that in the global value chains phenomena. We see that with tax havens, corporations in developing countries um, and in other countries actually don't have the same luxury of indulging in this corporate heaven activity that a lot of northern companies do, as well as this um, uh, sort of uh, commodifying of knowledge through patents. So there is a disproportion uh, which is ongoing and which we see in the rise of the corporation. Um, when it comes to the current pandemic, the response of the US and the UK uh, can be fairly described, I think, as one of colossal mismanagement. Discourse was both implicitly and explicitly about the opportunity cost of prioritizing certain lives over others. So on the 2nd of April, for example, there, is a, there are news headlines about shortage of ventilators. Uh, and one reason why doctors are forced to focus on patients with better survival rates, and also the fact that both countries have a very high mortality rate. Um, this failure, I think, has to be understood uh, as a result of the interplay between hollowed state capacity and corporate opportunity. That is, the empowerment of one hasn't taken place without the disempowerment of another. By this, I exclude the state's capacity to respond to the needs of the private sector, which is ongoing, but it does involve an erosion of the social contract of welfare and social policy. If we're talking about uh, the corporate's ability to capture on this gap, there are many examples. You just have to pick up the newspaper and you'll find tons of examples right now. But I will focus on uh, the response of the health sector. So in the, U in the US, the st strategic national stockpile, a reservoir of life-saving pharmaceutical and medical supplies was basically inadequate. Only 16,600 ventilators were available. Many were outdated. And this, of course, uh, was caused by a diversion of resources away from the, hand, uh, from the public sector, but also as a result of private equity takeover of a handful of companies involved in domestic manufacturing of ventilators. The repurposing of productive value chains to companies like Tesla and Ford meant a lengthening of the duration of response to the emergency, also incurring high costs, but also distributing these high costs to other logistic giants such as Amazon and Walmart. In the UK, we see a very different set of problems with, with the Brexit climate, but the favoring of giant corporations over SMEs and middle income, um, middle, sorry, middle uh, sized companies is also ongoing. So to give you one example, one a domestic company was actually exporting to the EU while there was a shortage of ventilators in the UK. At the same time, of course, there's piecemeal privatization of the NHS and a very strange model in the US in which private hospitals are investing in hedge funds, private equity, and continue to sit on hordes of cash uh, while that sort of taking money away from the public hospitals. Um, and we know, of course, that the private uh, insurance in the US does not respond in spite of all this investment. Uh, a second phenomena which uh, has been really discussed uh, right now with respect to corporate activities, this dissonance between um, rising stock exchange and uh, and the, the real economy. We, we know already, of course, that the stock exchange is not um, you know, not sort of reflective of the economy had has been for, for a very long time, uh, but fluctuations in recent months have been incredible. So, and this is owing to the rise of platform capital. Uh, people have very different definitions, but I define platform capital quite loosely as an intermediary, which could be data driven. So for example, Facebook, but also exists as a combination of e-commerce e and logistics such as Amazon. So this ability of platform capital to rise to this extent, especially in the current pandemic, is, is astonishing. Um, giant tech companies, for example, um, you know, become, uh, individuals have become millionaires, whereas 39 million Americans are right now unemployed. So we're really in this universe of trillionaires and, and breadlines. Um, but apart from that, there's also um, incidences of other corporate activity, which is quite worrying. So recent research publication by Transnational Institute and Corporate Europe Observatory points towards 
the possibility of litigation scenarios by some MNCs against states under the investor state dispute settlement. Uh, so basically, states can, um, multinationals are considering suing states based on COVID revocation of contracts. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, you, I'm sure you've read in the UK, uh, the Bangladesh um, garment sector, which has been suffering, is trying to claim a really large amount of money from a UK retail company, but it's not unsuccessful. But it's not successful at the moment. So I think we're talking about an economic model in which companies are able to benefit from a force majeure or an unforeseeable event, uh, a, a natural disaster. And this economic model, clearly there's something very wrong happening here. Um, in this context, finally, I want to talk about the, um, the rising role of corporate philanthropy. So the pandemic has also made visible the changing global governance model, which is heavily determined by corporate activity. This can be described in three ways. First, the role of corporation in multilateral governance. Second, the digitalization of social policy. And third, the reproduction of global platform capital. The ongoing weakening of multilateral governance um, previously run by uh, nation states um, has been under discussion a lot, especially with focusing on the UN. But not enough is mentioned, I think, on the role of the UN as a contracting body which outsources many of its major operations to private companies. These range from basic logistical services to humanitarian relief and even research and development. So reduction in state funding and reliance on corporate funding has a huge reorientation for the UN. The pharmaceutical lobbying in the WHO, for example, has pushed our, our research and development, which favors expensive drugs uh, and obsesses over acquisition and strategies for patenting. The major and this, of course, has a major implication for um, any any area of innovation. Gates Foundation now is the biggest donor. But I think I want us to imagine the possibility of a WHO which, can, which had it continued to work as it was planned, would have built the health capacity of the entire country. So we're talking about a vaccine building capacity or, or now a response to a pandemic, which could have been uniform had the WHO been empowered to do what it was built to do. Um, and we can talk about the need for a vaccine right now and what to do about it. But this was a really big missed opportunity because of the changing governance model. Second is the governance and digitalization of social policy. Since private tech companies are involved in producing and providing social safety net providers, domestic provide net, uh, projects domestically as well as internationally, they will increasingly rely, rely on tech to collect information. This could have repercussions for privacy breach, but also involve a welfare surveillance model in which social safety nets are based on certain social conformity behavior. We already see this happening in some countries. A data-driven re-engineering could become part of social policy with commodity commodification as a main driver. So, I mean, but having said that, of course, we need to remember that there are problems with philanthropy in itself. So, for example, the Silicon Foundation um, Fund, one of the largest philanthropic uh, fund, which is a pool of invest a pool of uh, funds coming by major tech companies, actually allows tax breaks to these companies without the need to um, spend this money immediately. So, money is being parked as kind of a tax break, and it's not certain where what what is going to happen. So that is another kind of power, and we don't know where this money would be disseminated or how. Finally, there is the very important part which um, we see happening a lot. It's a reproduction of the global platform capitalism. By this, what I mean is the inclination of tech giants to give to other tech companies as donations. So if you see Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, Gates Foundation, um, and if you isolate Twitter from this list and look at how it's um, distributing this money, for the pandemic specifically, it's actually giving to a lot of major platform companies as well as small platform companies. So companies like Give Directly, GoFundMe, uh, and, and at every and, and one billion is not given entirely to one platform capital. There are multiple platform capital companies, and when they give, every company of course takes a share for the services that is provided. In the end, a very small amount is actually given to this area of need. But this sort of uh, rent capture at every step of the way is, 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 is on the rise. And it has very ma major implications for developing countries as well. 
we now know that the health sector in developing countries has been completely decimated because of structural adjustment policies and massive privatization. And in some cases, GoFundMe and these other companies that are actually um, coming as saviors uh, for, for a lot of very small minor operations uh, and very small elements. Um, and these global linkages could be in the form of franchise. So a company uh, sitting in the UK or US and a, and a local venture then forming a, a chain, but um, there are also very different layers of how this process happens. So with these three processes and, there, and, and, and a lot of other activities which is strengthening corporate philanthropy, there is also the phenomena of bailout. And I will now give the floor to Carolina to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Carolina? Um, I think her sound is off. Oh, there we go. Yes, it's, it's on now. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Good. Thank you, Farmer. <laughs> yeah, so um, are you push us. Well, thank you very much for having me here today, anyway. <laughs> so I will um, try to push a little bit further on some, on, on some of the aspects that Farmer was mentioning but specifically regarding to the bailout of corporations, which basically is, you know, this, the response to the COVID-19 crisis, particularly from this business uh, perspective. And then while doing that, I also to take our attention to what that, what the, what the bailout actually means to society now and also in the future. So, the current uh, situation is, as we know, very uncertain and things are changing constantly. And so are uh, these policies and measures. So we've been trying to adapt here and keep up with all these changes. But uh, as far as I know by now, I can probably, I have probably identified over 10 uh, measures ranging from tax reliefs to loans to business uh, in the UK. And I'm sure we can probably you know, criticize all of them, see ways to improve all of them, and, uh, you know, saying how they're not efficient enough or how they could be well designed. And that indeed would be probably uh, a talk or a paper that we can write and discuss with constructive criticism. But what I decided to do today is, and I thought it would be more interesting, uh, was to go and discuss a broader Point that I think we should reflect on, which is basically how we think, how we elaborate, how we implement social and economic policies, having as uh, has, having as reference the market and the corporations, but within our capitalist system, and that's important. And I, I think if we do that, if you have clarity about this, then we can get into the technical aspects of these bailouts we can get into uh, the implications of this bailout and then start coming up with improvement or even just dish them all together. Uh, so I do think this is a very important discussion because if our starting point is that there is a unbalanced power relation between capital and workers, or if you like a conflict, uh, then what you're saying basically is that there is a one 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 consequences of any corporation uh, bailout, which is a burden that is shifted to working people who actually end up paying the cost of this bailout in a way or the other, which as a consequence will end up exacerbating inequalities in society. So just to give you an illustration, uh, and I'm going to mention an example that actually followed brought to my attention in the couple of days, which is the, the case of the British Airways that uh, has been relying on the government uh, for law scheme since April, but now just came up with uh, the possibility of cutting over uh, around 12,000 jobs. And I think what's important here is to give the, the background of what's happening, right? So, yes, yeah, VA is going through that process, but if you look back in the last five years, you can see VA also engaging with probably around 3.6 billion pounds uh, to shareholders that has been paying dividends and shares uh, buybacks. 
there is also in this background uh, the question of the International Airlines Group, which is the group that manages the British Airways, Airways sorry, that has been sitting uh, on a reserve of eight billion uh, pounds, as it goes back to some of the points that Fawa uh, made. And we should also consider that actually the same group has been able to guarantee uh, a uh, state uh, loan of around three a million from the, the Spanish government. So despite all this, this, this uh, cooperation is actually going to probably cut more than a quarter of the, the workforce, of its workforce. And not only is also proposing some adjustment regarding job contracts, which probably reflect more precarization of labor. So it's still in this kind of, uh, you know, trying to illustrate what's happening if we contrast that to some talks within the UK government regarding what to do after the crisis, right, with all this deficit that's probably heading to because of that scheme, we did talks regarding planning to freeze public sector pay or rising regressive taxes. So look into this and say, okay, companies are bad, governments are now liberal. But we can also bring to that discussion something we've been looking into it for a very long time, which is this power imbalance between capital and labor, which to go back to some of the powers uh, points as well, it takes the shape constant transfer of wealth, money from society to shareholders and financial speculators, which I don't want to get into that in detail for now. So yes, they argument, which is we need to keep business afloat during the crisis, right? This is this is a fact, yes, but we have to understand that there is much more involved logic of corporations and market, and then how this leads to that policies, to that economic policies, that social policies. And I think this crisis is somehow giving a, a golden opportunity to revisit this, okay? So, so let's try to recap something that is somehow very obvious in that context, which is the role of corporation, corporations Society. So how corporations are important for our current society in the way we organize in production. Yes, they generate jobs. We can't disagree with that. And they generate, you know, page. And in a monetary economy, which is our economy, this is very important because we keep the monetary flow going through the system. So if money, you pay bills, we then uh, pay our debt and keep things going. And that's actually important if you look, especially in the UK in the last 40 years, uh, where the, the public sector has been gone through so much cuts in market practices that have deprived society from the state provision. And, uh, and when it, in, in cases where it hasn't just deprived society from, from state provision, it has actually private sector through areas such as health and education. So more than ever, households, workers, they need that money, that monetary input, to kind of having access to some services. So, so of course we can see how corporations are important. We can see the argument you have to keep them afloat. Although we also have to consider that they don't do that for charity. Of course, corporations, they are in business because they profit owners. But this is like the obvious case. You can see corporations like this, it's fine, they have it to exist. But there's the other side, which is less obvious in the sense that it's not highlighted as much as, as it should in terms of being a structural problems, which is like these um, corporations that now they are very quickly lining up for bailouts from, from the treasuries, in fact, contribute very little to that own institution they are asking help for. And they're always complaining about contributing. So I think the it comes to taxes, right? How these corporations actually they have mastered the art of uh, tax avoidance with help actually of big accounting firms such as Lloyd, KPMG, and, and keep, sorry, KPMG, and so on. Uh, so what happens here is not the tax avoidance itself; is how actually these corporations they actively um, move to this offshore offshore tax haven and what that means is to the government basically and uh, and that has you know a set of implications uh, which there are many people looking to that in, in a very interesting way 
For example, we know that in that case, governments, they start competing with each other to kind of uh, offer a highest level of tax subsidy so that they can attract that firm, that company. But the, uh, the, the, the consequence is this capacity of these governments to then provide to their citizens. So there's a lot, lot of little things involved there. And the interesting aspect for us as well is how then we see these corporations relying on, on taxpayers' funding structures, such as road, rail, law and order and energy, but they constantly try to avoid uh, paying their share for the government in terms of uh, providing the services. So it, that is very interesting as well from the economic perspective, because what we have there is basically an like economic and a financial rationale where taxes, they are seen as expenses rather than a payment to the government. And the moral argument is not there either. So what that means is uh, it takes this uh, corporations or the rationale behind is they have to minimize their costs and taxes basically a cost. So if you want to run your business in a smart way, you have to reduce that cost. And there are other aspects here, for example, the relationship between corporations and the environment. Um, people, uh, economists look into that discussion, they, they know the, the, the efforts that are necessary in terms of regulations and in terms of uh, fines to, to kind of bring these corporations to stop polluting, for example. We know the lobby that these corporations, they involved within the government to avoid any policy that you kind of result of production. And of course, there's the, the scary thing about the carbon, uh, uh, which we know that also these corporations are within these uh, corporations are uh, born from, they are not and accept the idea that if you want to avoid global warming, we have to leave a very large proportion of the fossil fuels we already know that exist in the ground. So there are many things you can go and, and talk. I think the labor market um, deregulation is something that heterodox economists are really looking and, and show how corporations welcome labor deregulation because, of course, you allow them to cut their costs. And for me, what that us is this very clear conflict between society and corporations' interest, which makes us wonder if you have that in our mind, which is when the economic crisis they hit, okay, what welfare of workers, you know, is it still a priority? Or when you have economic crisis, is the environment still a priority? And I think if you keep that in mind, if you highlight this opposite interest between society and corporation, we can design, you can think of social economic policies differently. We can bring a more nuanced discussion to the rhetoric, oh, we need to keep this in the flood. And we can also bring more complexity regarding the discussion of uh, the implications of the corporation bailout, because right now, basically, these implications relate to the government deficits and how the government is going to find a way uh, out that problem. But they are much more involved if you frame the discussion in terms of that conflict. And that's not new, but I want to bring that to, to the discussion of the CODIV-19 rescue package for, for corporations. And just to head to uh, to the end of my talk and bring up some examples here. Um, the, I think the argument in a way is simple. We do have, you know, both sides of the economic and the political spectrum making the case for bailing out corporations. Uh, and I very much, although as economists, uh, kind of uh, agree with some measures such as, you know, the, for the job retention scheme and t tax holiday. But what I want to say is that we have to be clear about this conflict, because if we are very clear about that, we can see that these measures, they shift that cost to the working people, as I mentioned before, and most vulnerable, vulnerable people. Now, this is a very difficult argument to make for two main reasons. One is the, con the historical context we are, where, you know, there is, as I said, rhetoric about keeping corporations alive and the question of wages and the question of how we're going to bring the economy back on track straight away after the crisis. But I think the other difficulty is that by the end of the day, this is an argument that has to be done empirically. 
we need empirical analysis that go through these schemes, these rescue packages, and trying to show the implications, the diverse developments of these conflicts in each of these, these schemes. So in basically what I'm arguing here, it seems very simple, but it's not because what I'm asking is that we consider that macro policies, they are biased in favor of capital and against labor. And that is, is a very uh, interesting argument to make at the theoretical level, but at the empirical level is, is much more difficult. And uh, there are people uh, uh, within the heterodox spectrum trying to make that argument. I highly recommend the, the, the Institute of uh, Public Policy Research report on who wins, who pays who's who wins, uh, I think that's the name, sorry, where they are basically saying, you know, they're looking to this massive state intervention and in trying to show that some of these measures, you know, the job rotation scheme, for example, or the small and medium sized business loan, they seem very progressive, right? But they you would be progressive if they are somehow intervening or trying to change you know, the balance of uh, uh, the, the power in society. And uh, the term they use is, you know, if that intervention would actually uh, affect the balance of wealth and, and power in economy. So if you see it that way, so these um, policies, they can be progressive. And I finish you with a concrete example regarding the job rotation scheme, uh, because I think it's one of the most important uh, policy in that context. We can look into it from the perspective of the household as well, and uh, you know, it's unprecedented in the UK. And uh, we can go through that that job scheme, that the job rotation scheme, and get into the details, right? Get into the the technical aspect of it. So we know that many will be excluded from that support. We know that this doesn't stop the question of moral hazard that Fowler brought before, which is workers they can still get fired. We know that uh, you know it's just eight percent of the wages. So by the end of the day, households they are experiencing a very significant loss of income. So we can go through these technical issues, which in a way I would say that even if we can call them technical, if you visualize that in this broader conflict dimension, probably can see the design is actually uh, it failed to, to grasp how some of these policies would somehow fail to protect workers and households. But what I think is important here is to, and that's where I'm going to end, and that's the data I get from the EPP report, which is they have estimated that 40% of the net cost of the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme, will be spent on grant and debt. Uh, repayments. So um, around 10 billion if uh, considering just three months of, shut, of lockdown and 21 billion uh, considering six, six months of uh, lockdown. Uh, so households, they basically, they wouldn't have a way to meet these obligations without that scheme. But what is very interesting here is that that money is basically going to banks and landlords, and that's the contrast they are making the report, which basically can be considered as a implicit bailout for banks and landlords. Of course, the banks and the landlords can <laughs> come in and defend themselves in that sense, but what we're trying to do here is to show that, you know, there are the consequences of the crisis and how uh, and how each segment of society are taking the heat of the crisis, not evenly distributed, right? In that case, clearly banks and landlords, they're going to keep the continuing inflow of income. And that, of course, will exacerbate inequalities, and it doesn't really uh, uh, help us to take this opportunity to uh, somehow find a way to restructure a society in a, in a fairer way. So this is where I, I finish. You know, there are many other examples to go through, which is it basically can be framed in terms of moral hazard and how these companies, these corporations, they need a proper check if we're going to bail them out. But I, I would move away from the moral hazard aspect and, and bring the, the, the conflict aspect for us to, to do that analysis. And you can go through the, the questions. And, and I think we have to be very clear and sharp here that the government bailout of business, right, it has costs for society as a whole. And that has to be debated in a theoretical, empirical way that's convincing so we can approach policymakers and then make the case that we have to redesign that policies. And that's it. Thank you.